All right, hello everyone, and welcome to New York Wine and Grape Foundation's New York State of Wine. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. Diverse and bold with a long history stretching back hundreds of years, New York is reinventing itself as an epicenter of dynamic winemaking. The state is home to the first winery in the United States, and the producers are drawing on that background to produce some of the most exciting wines in the country. In this second episode of the series, Boldly Redefined, we focus on that rich history of grape growing and winemaking. So before we introduce the panel, uh, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to you. There is a chat section and a Q&A section. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. So just be sure to select everyone in the to field as it can default to panelists only. And the Q&A section is where we'd like you to submit your questions to be answered during the webinar. Now for the panel, uh, our host and moderator today is Felicity Carter. In addition to her role as editor-in-chief of Meininger's Wine Business International, Felicity is a regular wine judge, having judged in countries from Brussels to Georgia. In 2015, she formed part of the Empowerment of Women in Wine panel for Wines of Argentina. And Felicity is a regular keynote speaker at wine events from Hong Kong to Verona. And she is a member of the Magnum Club, a networking group for senior women in the international wine trade. Before taking her current position, she wrote for major Australian publications, including the Sydney Morning Herald. Joining Felicity are uh, Cameron Hosmer and Julia Hoyle of Hosmer Winery. Hosmer Winery, a fourth generation family farm is located on Cayuga Lake in the Finger Lakes. Cameron and his wife established their state winery in 1985 with grapevine plantings dating back to the 1970s and early experiments with plantings of classic vinifera grape varieties. Julia is the head winemaker of Hos at Hosmer Winery. She found her way to the Finger Lakes of New York State by studying at William Smith College, a women's college in Geneva, New York. The local wine industry piqued her interest as an undergrad student, which led her to apprenticing at Fox Run Vineyards on Seneca Lake. And her international experience includes harvest at Yolumba Winery in the Brasa Valley. Megan Frank from Dr. Constantine Frank Winery. Megan is the fourth generation of her family to manage uh, the winery in the Finger Lakes. She holds a bachelor's degree from Cornell University and two postgraduate degrees, one in wine business from the University of Adelaide, Australia, and one in enology from Cornell University. She holds the WSET level four diploma in wine and spirits and is a certified wine judge through the American Wine Society, among other accolades. She joined the winery in 2013 and Scott Osborne of Fox Run Vineyards. Scott started in real estate development in 1974, but soon gained an interest in wine and went on to work at top wineries in Santa Barbara County and California. In 1993, he returned to his native territory in New York State and purchased Fox Run, a partnership that has since transitioned to a family owned business. Scott is founding member and past president of Finger Lakes Wine Alliance founding member of the New York Wine Industry Association, established to represent the wine industry and to educate legislators on issues that impact New York state wineries and vineyards. Scott also serves as the New York representative on the board of Wine America, the national advocacy organization for the US wine industry in Washington, DC. So I won't take any up more time, uh, over to you, Felicity. So thank you very much. I have to say, I was really pleased to be asked to do this. My first experience of New York wines was in 2003 when I was in New York. And in those days, there was a bar which served uh, local wines. And it was the first time I'd ever tried um, Catawba and I tried the American hybrids. It was very interesting. I took some bottles back to Australia. And that was my first introduction. And the next time was actually in 2009 when I was at the London Wine Fair and New York was exhibiting and I tried the wines and I was amazed. They were completely different. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the elegant Rieslings and the, the interesting reds. And then this last week, I've been trying them again and I, I cannot believe how uh, um, astonishing the wines are. Really beautiful, cool climate. If I, it's always unfair to 
compare regions to one another. But if I had to think of a region that produces um, lovely, cool climate wines with lively acidity and uh, really nice aromas, but also where the makeup of the wine industry itself is made up of farmers and families and small holdings rather than big brands or trophy wineries. My, my comparison would probably be Austria. And one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years that wasn't true in 2003 was in 2003, the wines were, I mean, Catawba is a curiosity anyway, but um, the, even the Rieslings I tasted were a curiosity because those were the days of the big Australian wines and Parker. And that, was, that world was coming to an end in 2010 when I was at the London Wine Fair. But of course, now we live in a completely different world where the, the whole world is looking now for these lively, refreshing wines. And they can only be produced by by genuinely cool climate places. And unfortunately, because of climate change, the number of places that are cool climate um, that have any heritage are shrinking. I mean, we do, we do have new cool climate areas like parts of Scandinavia, but, but it's gonna take them a while before they produce really high quality wines. So I think, um, and the other thing that's changed is um, people are now much more interested in the heritage of the wine and who is making it and how they are making it. And in tandem with this looking for cool climate wines, people are also interested in small artisanal family owned wineries. So I think uh, New York is is a really exciting place that, that fulfills all of those things at once. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about the history. Now, so um, I want to come to, first of all, I want to come to Megan Franks because the, um, the history of the winery is, is amazing. Her great-grandfather, um, Dr. Constantine, um, was actually part of the Vinifera Revolution. So, Megan, can you talk a bit about that? And can you talk about why New York had so many hybrid vines and what your grand, great-grandfather discovered and how, and how he changed what was actually being planted? Yeah, absolutely, Felicity. Well, it's wonderful to be here with you all today. And certainly, yeah, I'd love to share with you a history um, about my great grandfather and, and his origin. So actually, um, grapes were beginning to grow and wine was being produced all the way back to 1829 in Hammondsport, New York, which is just six miles down the road from where we are here. Uh, a minister planted uh, vines in his rectory and it wasn't until 1862 that commercial winemaking and grape growing really started to take hold. And the grape varieties that were used were from the kind of American varieties of Vitis Labrasca, so Concord, Catawba, uh, things of that nature, Niagara. And, um, you know, Constantine at this time was in Europe. He was, um, uh, he had earned a PhD in viticulture. And I was a professor, was a researcher, a scientist, an experimenter, and he worked with varieties like Riesling, like Chardonnay, you know, Arcatzatelli, uh, Separavi, so really interesting things. And uh, he uh, came through New York, he was a World War II refugee um, with his family. And, uh, you know, they came by ship to New York City and the nearest location where they were planting vines and growing grapes from New York City at the time was the Finger Lakes. So um, Constantine was really perplexed, you know, that there was no vinifera already being planted, and he didn't accept the uh, the uh, idea that it was due to the cold climate, that that's why vinifera wasn't surviving. He um, had a theory that it was due to phylloxera, but of course he had a really difficult time communicating, you know, he didn't speak a word of English um, he spoke nine other languages, but that didn't help him as much as it would have helped um, for him to have English. And uh, arrived here at the age of 52. So he really set out to, um, you know, sort of introduce another avenue uh, of European wines and grape growing. And that's, that's certainly what he did for us here. So if I understand it, what he discovered that was that the problem wasn't the climate, it was the phylloxera. Um, and so that's how he managed to, to introduce them. Um, what was the reaction of, of people around once he started to make this? Were the, did people immediately start to say, yes, I want to plant this too? Um, yeah, I, I would say it was mixed. You know, there were some early adopters uh, in those years. And so he started, um, started planting first at Gold Seal Winery, which is just down the road. It's no longer in operation in 1954. That's when the first vinifera uh, trials were successful and then sort of out of frustration he started our winery in 1957 because gold seal 
you know, they were just looking at it as sort of a little science experiment, not really as a full fledged effort. Um, so he had a, he called them his cooperators. <laughs> so he used to say, you Americans deserve only excellent. He said that over and over. And um, because he had such a difficult past, you know, they left Ukraine, they are listed as non-persons because they fled oh. You know, during the war. So there, his entire record of, um, you know, his life work in, in Odessa was completely erased. So he left all of that behind and, um, you know, he had nothing to lose coming here. So he really uh, believed to his core that, you know, he wanted to introduce Vinifera and he had the, the grit and determination of someone, you know, half his age, his first vintage in 1962, he was 61. So at a time when most people would kind of consider retiring, he uh, started a whole new venture and he had uh, these people that would come from all over the U.S., you know, from Virginia to Ohio to New Jersey to Pennsylvania um, throughout, you know, the East Coast particularly. And they would come and they would learn the grafting technique, take that back to their home state. And he was very giving with his knowledge and very open. Uh, and even 1967, he started uh, what would become the largest consumer wine organization in America, uh, called the American Wine Society. So very much, um, you know, he wanted to, to lift the tide and, and rise everybody up. And uh, I think that that kind of sentiment has continued, you know, with our region, um, you know, with people helping each other, there's great collaboration. So that that has all kind of remained in that in that spirit. Would, could you put the, uh, Katie, could you put the map up? And um, Megan, could you explain where you are and something about the region? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so we are in the Finger Lakes, so kind of northwest, about five and a half hours, depending on how fast you drive from New York City. Um, so in that collection, so there's 11 Finger Lakes. Um, our winery is on that fork-shaped lake, Cuca Lake, uh, but Seneca and Cayuga, along with Cuca, make up kind of uh, the lion's share of, of where the wineries are, um, are located and where, where most of the vineyards are. Okay, and, and, go, and, and what do you think grows particularly well there? What's the region known for? Yeah, so Riesling. Riesling is our kind of flagship uh, for us personally and for many producers in the region. And because we have, you know, this really uh, interesting kind of glacial different soil types, there's a lot of interesting things with Riesling. Um, also sparkling does very well, you know, back in the 1860s, um, we have a very long history of producing traditional method sparkling wines, um, you know, with the French American hybrids, the native varieties, and then now vinifera today. So sparkling is fantastic because we are a true cool climate region and uh, these deep glacial lakes really hold the heat that helps us for the winter. So yeah, we, um, we're really into experimentation though. So it's difficult to, um, you know, we have Cabernet Franc is a fantastic red, we do Pinot Noir, um, also some Austrian varieties, Gruner Veltliner, Blau Frankish, some Georgian grapes, Arcazzatelli, Sapparavi. So we, we have kind of a large repertoire um, and I think that also makes the region quite interesting. And in terms of in terms of winemaking, uh, with 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 your grapes like Riccatelli and Saparavi, are you doing any experimental crevry or natural winemaking, or, or what's what's your sort of philosophy of winemaking? Yes, yeah. So we do kind of a stainless steel fermented and matured style with with our Cazzatelli. Um, We also do an orange wine as well, so skin fermented, and then we uh, mature the wine in amphora. Um, vessel. So we don't uh, go full on quivery with burying the, uh, the, the amphoras or the vessels in the earth. Um, it is something we're exploring. So we have a nice partnership with a winery in Georgia. And before oh. harvest, we, uh, we chatted with um, Orgo uh, in Georgia and, and Gogi, the winemaker, uh, has been in communication with us and kind of helping us fine tune the Arquette Stella and Sepravi. So I think that there's a lot to explore and there's a lot of... Um, connections that we we can share you know with Constantine's heritage as a uh, Ukrainian you know he had a lot of um the estate that he managed was our Castell and Sepravi so for us it's kind of the closest tie that we have to his heritage um but a very open region I think there's going to be a lot of cool things in the future uh some cool collaborations 
Now, some of the some of the people on the call, not everybody, but I know that some people have been able to get hold of some of the wines. And um, the the wine that people will have been trying was the 2009 Dry Riesling. I was I was really amazed by this wine. I'm sitting here in a place called um, the Rhineland Pfalz in Germany, where we are um, big Riesling producers. And the Rieslings here tend to be very structured and a little bit austere in their youth, whereas um, over at the Mosel, they tend to be very um, very charming, very light, with a sort of very particular sugar profile. And when I tasted this, I thought it had this all the charming light quality of the Mosul, but it was a little bit more aromatic and it had it had a slightly different acidity and, and sugar profile. But it was very, I, I, it's very, very, um, uh, you know, the, the aromas I thought were very new world, but the the structure of it was very old world. Um, that's that's my impression. I, I probably should, probably should have just asked you to tell me about the wine rather than give you my impression. Why don't you tell us about the wine? Yeah, no, I think that that's a really eloquently put, um, you know, it's hard to pinpoint our Rieslings as a region, uh, you know, from being exactly like this, exactly Mosul, like this is exactly Vaca, this, you know, things that we don't really fit in completely into any one category, um, which is quite interesting, I think, and that that speaks to where we are, you know, we are in the new world. Um, so yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would say um, kind of a uh you know riesling but also a lot of the other aromatic whites we work with Ries, uh, acidity is never in short supply <laughs> so we always have really brightness you know really nice brightness in the wines um and even the reds too they have this really nice beautiful acidity so um certainly i'd say i mean this dry riesling we produce uh, nine other styles of riesling from you know traditional method sparkling to uh when we can botrytis uh, dessert wines. So there's certainly a lot of diversity to be had, but this is kind of our flagship main series dry Riesling. You know, we're looking for that, you know, eight, eight and a half grams per liter residual to kind of balance that, that high acidity. Um, but yeah, this has certainly been, you know, important style for us. And uh, yeah, I would say it's very aromatic. 2019 was a great vintage. 2020 is going to be even better. We were just chatting before we all got online here. So we're excited about the future as well. Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, it's a wonderful wine. Right, now I'm going to move right along and start, uh, let's have a look at, um, I want to talk a little bit about the history of how um, New York went from being a farming community into, uh, you know, it, it's got a lot of wineries today. In fact, I think it's got, how many, how many wineries do you have? I, I've written it down. Is it 400 or something? Does anybody know? I think it's over 400, yeah, today. Right. So um, Cameron and Cameron Hosmer and Julia Hoyle. Um, Julia um, I, has got an incredibly impressive background. I was reading um, about you and uh, that you studied French and women's studies and that you, um, you eloped to Paris. That's yeah. very romantic. But <laughs> you worked in Africa for a while. Yeah, I did. <laughs> well, that was, that was nothing to do with wine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's to do with um, to do with passion, I guess, which is all about what this is. Okay, so um, Cameron, if I could just come to you. I mean, the the property, as I understand it, started life as a, a farm. What what made you what made your family decide to turn it into first a vineyard and then a winery? And can you talk a little bit about the history of the oversupply and how you know different legislation um, really turned the area into a winery area? Certainly. The, uh, the Finger Lakes, as you saw on the map, is a, a special area um, as far as climate goes. The, the lakes are deep. Seneca Lake is over 600 feet deep. Um, and there's a lot of, there's trillions of gallons of water in Seneca Lake and Cayuga Lake and uh, in Cuca Lake. So the Finger Lakes are deep, as you can see. And they provide, the reason the grapes are here is because they provide a moderating effect on our climate. Huge body of water, very rarely freezes, even in the winter. So when the temperature, when we have events in the wintertime in, in, you know, somewhere in December through you know, the end of February, um, these lakes give up their heat. So they, they steam in these cold mornings, they'll steam. And that moderates the temperature. And, and it also allows us to give a little bit longer season in the fall. 
because it keeps things warm. You know, we've had some issues this year with the scares of fall frost, which is always a problem. So, you know, the glacier, the giant glacier came across New York State and went, you know, all the way down into Maryland, basically. And this was about 20,000 years ago. It, it, it tilled the soil. So we have this soil referred to as glacial till. And then the, 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 the glaciers receded. The earth became warmer and the glaciers basically melted and left behind the Finger Lakes. And the end of the Finger Lakes are these things called terminal moraines, which is where the stone and the stuff that the glacier churned up made basically dams to create these lakes. And, and uh, so our soils are uh, basically glacial till. The subsoil is sedimentary limestone or slate or shale, which a lot, there was a, you'll see a picture of that here. And that was basically across the Finger Lakes. Soils of various depths. Some places it's quite thin where the, you know, the glacier just didn't leave as much. There's other places where the soil is quite deep. The series also, um, a very significant uh, agriculture in field crops such as corn and soybeans. And those grow in the, in the sites that maybe aren't, don't have the air drainage or slopes that goes to the lake. For the most part, the vineyards are planted on, on sites that slope down towards the lake to allow cold air to move away from the vineyards themselves. We now, planted uh, grapes here in, uh, in Hosmer in 1972. And that was under the, well, you know, this farm had been in my family, has been in my family for a hundred years. And up until 1972, when we planted grapes, the farm was uh, primarily hay, corn, and soybeans, of, of which we rented the land out. So we were not active farmers at that time. But in 1972, under the direction of the Taylor Wine Company from Hammondsport, that Megan spoke about, um, they were looking to expand in areas that had suitable sites, uh, and we had one. And so we planted a, a some acres of red hybrid Deshaun Act under the direction of the Taylor Wine Company. And that was a, at that time in the early 70s, red wine consumption in the uh, United States was 75% of what people consumed. So to meet that demand, a lot of the wineries that are were formerly just grape growers um, and it's planted for the Taylor Wine Company to supply their demand. And things in the wine business, we're not really in control. The consumer is in control. And, and, uh, and, and they changed in the, in the mid-70s. They, they decided that they wanted the consumer, United States consumer, wanted to drink white wine. They wanted to have, mm -hmm. you know, Rhine wine, lower alcohol, and they wanted a dietetic. And, and, and grapes are not a faucet. You can't just turn the hot to cold. You can't change the white to red and, uh, or red to white. And, and so there was, at that point, a bit, a bit of a shift that, you know, the larger wine producers didn't forecast. And so us as growers for the Taylor Wine Company, you know, all of a sudden we have these red hybrids that, that were very successfully grown, but, but they didn't want them anymore because the customer changed their mind and wanted something white. And, and that impacted the industry significantly because all of a sudden there was an enormous amount of grapes on the market with no home because the customer wanted something different. So I'll just, I'll just jump in here. So the Taylor Wine Company was established in the end of the 19th century and it survived through prohibition. And uh, so a lot of people were growing for it. So this must have been, a, this must have been a, a, a really big shock to the area when this happened. But in the 1970s, as I understand it, this actually helped paradoxically to drive people who had been growers to establish their own wineries. So in some ways, if I'm correct, uh, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, this, this really was the making in some ways of New York as a wine region. Is that- Oh, right? you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. We're, we're, we're growers. We're stuck with grapes. What are we gonna do with them? Well, 
I guess we're going to take fate into our own hands and make our own wine. And I had studied winemaking at Cornell and, you know, I had a, you know, a, an idea of how it was done. You never had know how it's done until you do it. And we, we started our first vintage in 1985. And I'll be honest with you, it was a learning process. And, you know, we had some success and some failures. And, you know, and we're not alone. I was not alone. There's a whole team of people that did the exact same thing as, as us. And, you know, they said, well, well, we're stuck with our grapes. I guess we want to, you know, keep our future. We got to, we got to make our own wine and, you know, follow the Franks and, and uh, let, me, let me ask you if, if you were, you know, if you had all of these red grapes and a big company had finally said, you know what, consumers don't want them. What, what did you do with those? How did you, how did you take what you had and turn it into a viable business? We turned some of them into wine and some of them we pulled out because okay. we had to. it was just, you know, we couldn't force the consumer to all of a sudden go back to liking, um, you know, dry red wines that, you know, the, the so a, a lot of grapes got pulled out, but you know, that hurts and it's expensive. Yeah. And uh, you know, so we turned some of those grapes into our own wine. And like I said, there's a whole league of us, I would say, where people that kind of got forced into the, in, into making wine. And the state was, uh, you know, understanding, the state of New York was very understanding about this. And they said, how can we help these guys? You know, agriculture, you can't just all of a sudden you know, bleach your red grapes into white grapes. So the industry takes time to change, but they, they passed some legislation which uh, reduced the fees to do establish a winery. So, you know, it was just a little bit of a nudge, the New York State Farm Winery Act, which, uh, you know, made it a little more, you know, financially available to become a winery. So that burden was lifted and it was just enough to shove a bunch of us into the game. Now, you would, when, we, when we spoke earlier, you told me, I think, that um, one of the Trimbach family in the 80s came and suggested that you had really, really good soils. Is that correct? Yes, Pierre Trimbach came to visit the Department of Education, brought some uh, Trimbach and some folks from Burgundy and some folks from Bordeaux. And, and Pierre Trimbach came to Hosmer and tasted our wines and, and politely said they, they were okay, but then he said, but I got a 300 year head start on you. <laughs> and okay. I took that to me, you know, the, 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 you learn over time where, what grapes grow where, um, how to grow them. I mean, for example, um, Gruner Veltliner is a relatively new variety here in the Finger Lakes. And, uh, you know, it was really fun for us. We, we planted it. It's really fun because we didn't, we didn't know how to grow it. And, and there wasn't too many people to ask how and how to make wine out of it when they arrive, when, when do you pick them? How do you handle the wine? You know, that, that is, that's fun. That, that's interesting. And, you know, you sure you, you stumble a little bit, but uh, that makes this game interesting. So what did you, okay, so what did you learn about grape varieties? What did you learn that worked really, really well? What, what have you learned now? Like what, what works really, really well in the Finger Lakes? And what doesn't work? What, what were your failures? Well, what really works is there's two, there's two real kings in the Finger Lakes. Riesling, of course, of which I think is the largest vinifera planted variety in the Finger Lakes. You know, and we make, as you know, Megan makes eight styles of Riesling. We do the same. You know, it can be anywhere from bone dry, kind of, as we say, jumpy. Um, to, uh, you know, very elegant, sweet ice wine. So, you know, it goes ice a whole range and of things you can do with that. They, so they're, they're, they're like, I guess, like Canadian ice wines. You were sort of in the same area. And Julia, I want to come to you. What are the challenges of working in the Finger Lakes? The biggest challenge would probably be how the weather shifts around so much. Um, you kind of have to be ready to shift with whatever Mother Nature is going to do, which is also part of the fun. Um, and it's during describe, the describe the weather to me. What are the highs? What are the how how hot does it get? How cold does it get? What what is your fog? What is your wind? Give me the give me the lowdown on your meteorology. Let's think. So sort of July is when it's going to get hottest, and it's like mid nineties Fahrenheit. Um, so what, high thirties Celsius um, would be hot. Um, this was a hot summer for us. We had 
several days. Um, and there's high Hot summer on record. Yep. And there's high humidity as well through the summer. So it's not, you know, it's the East Coast of the United States. It's not particularly dry. Um, and then the lows, I, mean, I remember when I was working at Yolumba, there was a cold dip and with the wind chill, um, I got an email from my partner. He said, oh, yeah, it's, it's negative 35 with the wind chill right now. And I said this to the winemakers at Yolumba and they're like, well, what's that in Celsius? And I was like, it's negative 35 in Celsius. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they're the same that's when they hit the same mark yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we have a wide range in temperatures that's rare yeah um, you know usually so we're, um right around sort of uh, zero fahrenheit we'll hit that around new year january is when it gets cold yeah um, we have snow protection as well um, we have a lot of lake effect snow coming from the great lakes um, and, and what about what about humidity from the lakes? Do you suffer from humidity problems or from rot? I mean, what are your challenges? So we do have, you know, it's a humid climate. So certainly we have to keep our eye on sour rot. I think, um, and Cameron can definitely speak to this with 40 years of vineyard experience or almost 50. Um, you know, people have gotten better about leaf plucking. And, you know, we're thinking about what do we want to apply in the vineyard that might, you know, keep rot at bay, but also allowing wind and sun exposure. Um, and so it's humid, but we manage it. Uh, in a really wet year, it's a challenge, uh, but you do what you have to do. If you need to drop fruit on the ground prior to harvest, you just have to. So, right. so, so why don't we talk about your, why don't we talk about your lovely Chardonnay? Can you, can you talk about how you made it and just talk us through the Chardonnay? And, and remembering that some people won't have tried it. Yes, yeah. Um, so this is our house Chardonnay. Um, it, there is a small oak component to it in really neutral barrels. Um, on the property, we have three different blocks of Chardonnay. This primarily comes from the oldest block, which is about 40 years old. Um, the fruit, we picked it in sort of high 40s Fahrenheit, so quite cool. We crushed it up and I soaked it uh, for, I believe, two, yeah, two days. And then we pressed it off. Um, so allowing some skin contact, it's not sort of a classic aromatic varietal, say like a Virch Um, but I do love skin contact with Chardonnay and um, we have relatively thin skins in the Finger Lakes and there's just a lot of really great flavors in there and you're not going to be fighting the phenolic tannin battle um, because they're thinner skins. Okay, we've got a couple of questions already. Um, which is, I'm probably going to get you to answer on behalf of everybody. What's the percentage of whites to reds now? And what's your normal harvest time? Well, harvest is right now. So we start, I'll start with that and then go back to the percentage because I have to think about that. But, um, so we start mid-September or so. Um, sparkling wines will be a little earlier, maybe the first week of September. I'd say that's the same for everybody. Um, and we usually wrap up by the first week of November, dessert wines aside. Um, you know, if people are going for an ice wine harvest, they could have fruit out till January easily. Um, portfolio makeup, we're probably what, 30%? 30% red, red. 70% white wine. Yep. Cameron, uh, just a final question. I mean, how did you convince, how did you convince people to, you know, so, you, so you've got all these vines and you're ripping things out and you're planting things. How did you find your new customers? How did you convince people to drink your wines? How did you introduce your wines to people? That must have been tough. Well, it's a, it was a region and that, that's not something that you can do by yourself. So the, like the, there was my neighbors, we, you know, there's a, here on Cayuga Lake on the West Shore of Cayuga Lake. There's a bunch of wineries, like six of us, that all basically started at the same time. And so we brought customers and we created the very first wine trail in the United States. Mm. And one of our members, Mary Plain, had gone to Europe and had seen a route to Vin. And she came in France and came back and said, we need to do the same thing. We need to bring people together, work together to bring people to the Finger Lakes to taste wine. Because you really, you know, as a solo person out there, you know, today's a little, might be a little bit different, but in the early 80s, you know, it took a group to bring people here. And, and, and you know what, we're still working that way as a group. And uh, I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, us as wineries, you know, they say, oh, it's the competition. Well, 
you know, we compete with each other, sure, but we work together too a lot because you just can't stand alone in this game. Mm. Okay, so now I'm going to come to Scott from Fox Run Vineyards and um, all I want to hear from you is I want to hear your story and I want to hear about um, in the context of the Finger Lakes. Can you, can you tell us how you got started, why you got started, what attracted you to New York and what you found when you came here? And by the way, I, uh, I have a glass of your Limburger. Oh, good. <laughs> well, it's really interesting. I was working in uh, Santa Barbara uh, early 80s and uh, I'm from Rochester came back to visit family and did a little wine tasting tour around Seneca Lake and um, I tasted a Wagner 1982 Wagner Chardonnay and, and it was really the first cool climate wine I had ever tasted because even though California in certain areas like to tell you it's a cool climate it's we have a cool climate here in the Finger Lakes and and um that was the style of wine I wanted to make. I, it, you know, it was the, that refreshingness, the acidity, the liveliness, and the food friendliness. So I gave notice, packed up my bags, and came back here in 1985, um, hoping to get a job. Well, there, I think, you know, what, there were 20, maybe 30 wineries in the Finger Lakes, and every one of them had a winemaker, so uh, or the owner was making the wine. So I ended up um, working for retail, wholesale, and then rent Pindar Vineyards on Long Island. And like I said earlier, in 1993, I, uh, I, I came back here, took over Fox Run, and purchased it. Um, if you, Katie, if you can throw up the sunrise photograph there. that uh, uh, So I, I like this photograph because it not only is it a Fox Run, but um, I really believe that between 85 and 95, 96, 97 was the sunrise of the, the Finger Lakes wine industry. And you had people like Tunker and many other wineries uh, that were starting to come on board and they were starting to make some um, pretty decent wines. Um, the groundwork had been set up by Dr. Franks, by Herman Weimer, and a couple of other wineries. Uh, but uh, there was a, cert, a, a sort of a second wave that came through in the 90s. And, um, and I think this is when um, the collaboration that Tunker was talking about on Cayuga Lake, Seneca Lake formed their wine trail in 1986. And this collaboration of let's bring people into the, in, you know, we got to get people down here to recognize that there is a wine industry here. Uh, you know, Rochester and Syracuse are, are, were, are huge cities and they, they had no idea we existed. So it was, um, uh, it was a, to me, a real exciting time. Um, we were able to try different things. A number of us got together and decided to focus in on Riesling. And one of the things that we all discovered was that all of us were making Riesling. And that um, basically told us that, you know, here is one variety that every, every winery is making and they're making it because one, we get a harvest every year and it's always good fruit. We've uh, all learned how to make uh, decent uh, Riesling. So let's focus on one variety. And that I think was the beginning of a lot of recognition worldwide for the Finger Lakes. You're on mute. <laughs> God, you think I've learned by now. Okay, I have a question for all of you, which is that cool climate is a, I hate to say it, but it's a hot category right now and it's going to grow. And these wines, I think, are probably going to hit, um, hit the market, the international market. How much do you export now? How much do you want to export? And how much can you expand? Can you, can you talk about supply? I can, I can sort of okay. take that. Uh, We've been doing uh, export. We had a, a we formed a company that uh, myself and Anthony Road and Red New uh, um, formed a company that to uh, import our, our wines and, and New York wines in, into uh, Europe. And that was uh, 2013. I think one of the issues that all of us experience is, is people come in and say, "Oh, I can't get your wines. You know, I can't get New York wines anywhere." Well, I think part of the problem is is that many of the wineries are less than 5,000 gallons. So uh, probably 80% of the wineries in, in New York are less than 5,000 gallons. Well, 
and most people can sell that right out the front door. So um, as our industry start to expand um, and we start to increase our production, you're starting to see more and more wines, not only outside of New York, throughout our country, but into other markets like, like Europe and Canada. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really stopped um, many wines, particularly from Oregon and some of the, the wines from California from the export market is actually because they're very expensive by international standards. But, but you, I'm, I'm not saying they're not worth it, but they are very expensive. Um, but your wines are actually very, very well priced. Um, so how much, how much do you, Megan, how much do you think you can expand? And I have a question here. Do you have any desire to expand your brand to a mainstream mass audience beyond your current demographic? That's a question for all of you, but I'll give it to you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, for us, export's pretty small. We're about 5% um, is exported. And it just takes, it takes so much more effort, obviously, uh, to, to gain, you know, those customers and travel. And Japan's actually our biggest export market. Um, and I think because of the cuisine, they're very white wine oriented, Riesling oriented. So I think there's, you know, some great things happening there. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, it's, it's difficult for us, and, uh, and Cameron kind of mentioned this too, um, for us as a region, you know, we can't uh, field graft, we can't just change over a variety like very quickly. Uh, the vines actually have to be rit ripped out and then we have to do bench grafting because of our cold climate. So it takes a really long time, you know, to establish the vineyards and change things. So uh, in terms of expansion, it's a, a slower road, I would say. And, um, you know, as uh, the region begins to develop, um, I'm sure, you know, we'll, ex we'll continue to expand over time. We just put on um, an addition to our winery to kind of make a little bit more room for more tanks and, and more equipment. But it's a slow growth mentality, I would say, for a lot of producers. And that, that speaks certainly for us. You know, we started with a cinder block <laughs> little building that Constantine built, um, you know, with some help with some friends. And uh, that's just kind of room by room expanded over time. So it certainly speaks to the region that we're, we're we have the slow growth, this, you know, majority family owned mentality that you're planting the vineyard for then your children you know, to, to reap the benefits of that vineyard. So this kind of long-term slow growth mentality, it, it seems to be kind of certainly for where we're going and, and a lot of producers in the region. Okay, can I also ask you, what challenges do you have? I mean, if you've got a humid climate, it's very cold. What challenges do you have in terms of sustainability? Um, how possible is it to do organics? Um, is there a move towards that? And secondly, how is climate change changing the way that you work? Um, and somebody actually asked, have you seen temperatures rises and changing weather patterns? Yeah, um, well, certainly if, if any of my colleagues want to step in too, but yeah, it's a, it's a challenging place to <laughs> grow grapes and make wine. Um, but, you know, the best things happen when you're kind of on the edge, you know, living on the edge, as Julia mentioned, that kind of makes things exciting. Um, but our Achilles heel is certainly the winter you know, Julia mentioned that negative 35 degree night, you know, that certainly is possible. Um, and hilling up is a really important thing for us, you know, um, as, as my colleagues can talk about. So we have additional challenges because we're in a cold climate and you can see the Finger Lakes here. Um, we do have this great moderating effect, um, you know, from the, the deepest lakes, uh, Cayuga, uh, Seneca, and then Lake Ontario is over 800 feet deep. So kind of helping to stop those northern um, Arctic winds from uh, from destroying, you know, our vineyards. So I would say um, winter damage is certainly a challenge. Uh, as we get into, uh, you know, climate change and, and just speaking about, you know, spring frosts, have never really been an issue, you know, for the Finger Lakes, you know, there's a handful of incidences where, uh, where it is, but unfortunately, we had a terrible episode in May, uh, where we had snow and, and very cold temperatures. And uh, some of the, the vineyards were still dormant and were protected, but others had the earlier, you know, ripening, earlier budding varieties like Chardonnay had become, you know, started to come out of dormancy. And I, I feel that, that that's going to be a really big challenge for us um, in the future that we had not seen previously, uh, that the spring frost, you know, as spring comes later and uh, everything is condensed, we may, we may have a challenge with that. 
Um, but speaking with organic, we're not certified organic or biodynamic, but there are producers that are um, becoming certified and, and really going down that road. And I think as the knowledge increases, you know, we're really blessed to have Cornell University and Agritech, uh, the experiment station, which is still our premier um, educational and experiment station, um, you know, at the forefront of testing and, and uh, looking at organic spring. on. So yeah, so I would say it's definitely possible and there's a lot of people working with that. But I don't know if, if our my colleagues want to expand on that anymore. Well, actually, I'm just going to jump in. Um, I, we've got a question um, for Scott, which will allow me to segue back to your wine. Um, is Lemberger the commonly used name for this variety in New York? And if not, what made Fox Run pick this name over something like Blau Frankish? And then maybe you could introduce your wine and tell us something about it. <laughs> I get that question all the time. Um, 1997, well, we planted Lemberger in 1995, and uh, we planted it originally for color uh, for our Pinot because, you know, one of the last uh, things to happen in a grape in terms of its ripeness is color. Um, and we found we could uh, add 1% or 2% Lemberger to the Pinot and it would give it its, its color, but... 1997, Peter and I were uh, invited uh, by USAID to go to Hungary and give seminars on uh, wine sanitation and wine tourism. And, and we were touring through um, Egar and tasting all these Kick Frankoches, and, which is another name for Lemberger. Um, and mm -hmm. Peter just said, I can make wine like this. So in 1997, we came back, um, we made our first Lemberger. I call it Lemberger because um, I really believe that people don't drink a versamener because they can't pronounce it. And um, Blau Frankish, Cake Frankosh, and the other 57 different names for Lemberger uh, mm -hmm. that are out there uh, are just too much of a mouthful. And Lemberger is very easy for Americans to pronounce. And so we've kept it. And it's, uh, it's a great, strong variety for us. We... Uh, uh, it's one of our biggest selling wines, especially down in New York City. So uh, <clears throat> Blau Franc is really never came around until about five years ago, I think it was, or six, five or six years ago when the Austrians uh, decided that uh, Blau Franc ish, which is what they call it, that they wanted to push it in the United States. So, Does that, um, does that help you when somebody... Um you know, like Austria comes and, and promotes their wine, does that help you promote yours? Um, in the case of Lemberger, I don't, uh, I don't really know. I mean, we try to t give people the, we tell people, you know, Lemberger is also known as Blau Frankish, it's also known as Cake Frankosh, you know, and then, you know, it's so many people who, some people have heard of Blau Frankish, but they've never tasted it, or they've heard of Lemberger and they never heard of Blau Frankish. So, um, I don't, I think if they came in with Lemberger, it'd be easier to sell Lemberger, but it, it really sells itself. Mm. One of the, I, when I left California, the, the, uh, winemaker there told me I'd never make a red wine again. And, and um, I have since found out, um, that's not true. He also told me that it was so cold back there, the wine's freezing in the, in the barrels. And Katie, if you can show that photograph, um, but we cold stabilize our wines by freezing them in the tanks. It's a lot cheaper. Wow. Um, and it, I like I like this photograph because it really shows that we are a cool climate region. Um, and you can see by that photograph. It's amazing. Um, I just sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, while we're talking about the wine, I just want to um, uh, tell Julia a comment from the box. I don't know if you can see it from Hervé Lalo, who's a very important Belgian writer. He said, I liked very much the lightness of Hosmer's Chardonnay, not the fat oily style, more Chablis than Merceau, which is not a bad thing to have said about your wine. Um, and, and the other thing that's coming up is that this Lemberger is a terrific price. I mean, I, I do think the, the price of these wines is, is great. It's a, a very competitive Price. Well, we're, we're really fortunate here in that uh, land prices are really cheap. Um, our labor prices are a little less than everybody else. Um, you know, and, and that, you know, that is reflected in the price. 
Okay, I want to ask, and we've, we're sort of running out of time, and it's, it's so interesting, but I want to ask what role do the hybrids play? Um, because one of the things that's happening in Europe is there's a sudden new interest in hybrids and peewees, the, the, um, the mold-resistant varieties and so on. Are you seeing an uptick of interest in the hybrids, or do you see a future for them? Or if somebody could just talk about that, how much they still represent of what's being planted? Well, go ahead, Tunker, go ahead. We're, uh, we're seeing a little bit of interest in hybrids, the old hybrids, and, uh, and people are making some pretty decent wines. They're rediscovering them, so to speak. And, uh, you know, the, let the product speak for itself. And, and the hybrids, learning how to make the wines from those varieties is the trick. And, uh, and it's being done pretty well. And there is a pretty good interest, I think, in the younger consumer that just says, hey, I like the taste. I don't, I don't care if it's a hybrid. It doesn't, that doesn't even ring, doesn't mean a thing to me. Because, you know, probably some of these long-standing vinifer varieties are hybrids of something else from a prior, you know, millennium years ago. Or we just, yeah, there's a... We're not giving up on the hybrids completely. No way. And just to, uh, just to, to follow up on that, the, the the problem with the hybrids early on in the New York wine industry is they were making some really bad wines. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if you make a bad wine and everybody's making bad wines, what's the impression going to be out there? And, and I think that has changed. We have... Um, well-trained winemakers who um, are learning the different uh, characteristics of some of these hybrids and they're making some really nice wines. Um, and, you know, as things heat up around the world, you know, we all have to be looking at different varieties because um, there are going to be some areas where certain, certain vinifera varieties are just not going to be able to grow. Yeah, I got one true. last comment, which I want to follow up on what Megan was talking about on the, um, about the slow growth that happens here in in the Finger Lakes. And it, it, one of the things that uh, I like to say is that as we farm for money, we don't farm with money. And <laughs> when you, that is a, that's just the way it is. And, and so we're going to have slow growth because we don't have millions of dollars in our back pocket to just fund whatever we want to do. Okay, I have a question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to roll two questions into one. Um, what's actually this? This is an interesting one. I, one of the things was when I saw the uh, the New York wine stand at the London Wine Fair. I said, "What are you doing in London?" And they said, "We feel that we need to build the reputation of New York wines outside uh, in, a, in a credible market like London because New York sommeliers won't serve them." So, I mean, that was ten years ago. And I've got two questions that speak to that and whether that's changed. Um, what's the general reputation of New York wines within the USA compared to other regions? And what's the hook that you find entices your customers? Is it that people are passing through on tourism and they discover them? Is it the varietals that interest people? Is it the fact that they're cool climate? Or is the interest the fact that they're from New York? Mm. That's a lot. That's yeah. a lot. But tell, us about, tell us about the reputation of, of New York wines. I'll jump in and then uh, anyone else feel free to add on. Um, so I think, well, one of our challenges, even within the United States is, you know, Hosmer wines, you can only find us in a few states. Um, Fox Run, Dr. Frank, I, at most probably, what, 20 states? Um, so we're just, we're not widely distributed within the state of New York. Um, New York City is, I would say, more and more interested all the time. What has been really fascinating this past year the sheer number of people coming to the region because they can't fly to Europe, say, and they're coming and visiting the Finger Lakes. And almost a lot of people are discovering it for the first time, a region that they heard about maybe for four, five, six years, and they can get in their car right now and come visit from Boston, New York City, or Philadelphia. Um, so I, I'll be curious to see what kickback comes from that in the coming years. There's already building interest. Um, and does that just kind of speed it up a little more? Um, but we're not quite as, you know, when you're in California, I feel like there's a lot of, we want California wine, right? When you're a lot of major cities and that's not always the case in New York City. Um, it can be a harder 
sell, depending where you're going. Okay, we have got six minutes left of this very interesting discussion. So can I come to you all and can you give me a view of what you think the future holds uh, for you particularly? To start with you, Megan. Yeah, well, I think the future is very bright, you know, for the, for us and for the region as a whole, you know, as we continue to develop new markets and, um, you know, get further into also the American market too. I think that uh, there's a lot of potential. So my, my grandfather in the 80s, you know, he would call it missionary work, <laughs> you know, go out and, and knock on doors and pound the pavement. And, and, and I think a lot of us are just you know, really investing in in that educational component and, and really trying to, as Julia mentioned, also get people to the region because the more people that come, they just immediately become ambassadors because the, the region is so gorgeous. You know, it has this really palpable sense of authenticity um, with the family farms, with uh, the local, you know, farm to table restaurants, really quaint B&Bs. So I think, you know, as we continue to expand and develop, we're also looking at, you know, different varieties that Constantine had planted way back in the 1960s that um, my grandfather in the 1980s took out because, you know, nobody was interested in Eligote and ferment and <laughs> things like that in the 80s. Um, but today, you know, the, the consumer, as we've kind of mentioned, is much more open-minded. So I think we'll continue to experiment and and kind of ride with that change. Julia and Cameron, what do you think? What's the future holds for you? I think the future holds uh, two things that we're going to see here in the Finger Lakes, and Scott touched on it, is, uh, you know, our climate's changing. There's no getting around it. We're get, It's getting warmer. Um, we're seeing more what I would call events, you know, hail and, you know, spring frost. And Megan mentioned spring frost. And and, uh, you know, those events, I think, are going to come more frequently. We had some hail in this area, which we, you know, go, grow grapes for 25 years and never see a single hailstorm or a spring frost. And now it's maybe not that unusual. Some of us have invested in uh, climate mitigation devices, wind machines to warm the weather and take these events, you know, to soften the events. And the other thing that I think that this area is going to see is there's some interest um, from outside money. As Scott said, you know, we're farming for money, not with money, but I'm, we're starting to see some people coming into the area and starting wineries and, and uh, you know, they have deep pockets and, and there's very few of us that ever started like that. So I think that's going to be something that we, we may see more of. Yeah, that's a that's really the definition of a double edged sword because money, you know, can bring you attention and you, it can bring you that big brand building, but you know, it, it, it can also drive up land prices as well and, and it can have some very unpleasant effects. Julia, what do you think? What, what for you is the future? I think a lot of experimentation. Um, so Tim Hosmer, who's not here because he's out harvesting grapes, is Cameron and Marin's son. Tim and I are about the same age. And we talk about this a lot, sort of, you know. 20, 30, 40 years from now, which great varietals are going to do well with climate change, you know? And so what do you want to try on now thinking 20 years or 30 years down the road with, you know, different temperature swings, different humidity, just different challenges. What, what's going to make sense as well as holding on to a regional identity. Um, but I think there'll be a lot of experimentation to adapt as everything always is, but to adapt to our changing climate. Okay, Scott, you have the last word tonight. And when you talk about the future, I'd like you to explain to us in one sentence, what can our audience take away as being the def definition or the personality of New York? Well, I think um, we're small, mostly small family owned farms um, and wineries. I, and I think that when they visit here, the beauty of the area and the quality of wines are as, Good as anything anywhere else in the world, and uh, it and it's a steel deal too when it comes to visiting. Uh, a steel deal. You're going to spend it. as much money as you would in the Napa Valley or in Burgundy or Australia. So, and then we have a very bright future. 
Okay, well, you know what? We have finished at one minute um, before we needed to finish. So I, I want to thank everybody. I think it's the most interesting tasting. I'm sorry that not everybody on the call got to try these wines, but I think I can speak for everybody listening when I say I, I can't wait for us to be able to actually come and visit and meet you all in person. I think I think what you've told us about your history is wonderful. And uh, I think the, you know, the fact that you're cool climate and you've got this wonderful geology and the wonderful present, you know, position next to New York, I think, uh, I think it's all good. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much to our very distinguished audience for listening and for all of your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you, Felicity. Thanks to our panel uh, and thank you to all our attendees. Uh, a recording of today's webinar will be published to our YouTube channel in the next couple of days and all of you participants will receive an email with that link. And we hope that you'll join us next month on November 19th as we continue this series with an episode focused on the wine regions of New York State with our host, Master of Wine, Essie Avalon. And again, that will be November 19th, so please mark your calendars. Thank you again and wishing you all an enjoyable week.